Qué bueno verlos. Gracias. Gracias. Igual. <coughs> Qué bueno verlos. 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 Es que ¿Cómo está? How are you? Bueno, bueno. Um, when do you worship? Cuando adoras. Is it just inside of the church building? Solamente dentro del edificio de la iglesia. What would you say if I asked you that? ¿Qué dirías si yo te preguntara? You worship while driving. You're supposed to be watching the road when you drive. In the house, I talk to God. <laughs> what is worship? Okay, that is a form of worship, but that we would call that what? Prayer. Okay, actions, the way we think. Okay, anything else? She said praying. Mitro, Praise in song. Uh, Domingo was leading worship. Reading the Bible. So there's no set time or place. Our life should be a life of worship. So it doesn't stop when we leave the building. <coughs> right? Amen. Amen. And so Daniel, Daniel, Daniel had a problem. Tenía un problema. These officials of Darius in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, if you want to turn there, they didn't like Daniel. No. And why didn't they like him? Because he didn't worship their God. Okay, he didn't worship their God, but but he was taking their position. Pero tenía una posición. Darius was going to make him basically in charge. Now, who was Daniel? He was a foreigner. He didn't belong there. No era de allí. And so now he's going and he's going to take your position. Y ahora él va a venir the position that you think you should have. Posición, la posición que tú crees que debes tener. Maybe you get a little jealous. Tengo un poco de yeah. And so what these officials decided to do was, they said, I know what we'll do. We'll look around at his work ethic. We'll find something wrong there. Well, well guess what? They didn't. You say, well, we'll just look at the way he behaves in general. Look at his life. And you know what the conclusion they came to was? The only thing that they're going to find wrong with Daniel was the law of his God. Now imagine that was you. And the only thing that someone could find wrong with you was your faith. How did Daniel get to that point? What was it about Daniel? What did he do? What can we see from his life that, that we can have that same thing? A life of worship. We're going to go into Daniel's upper room. And you know what we're going to find? Prayer. Confession and thanksgiving. 
Daniel, I don't think, was sinless, but he did have a life of worship. He drew his strength from that relationship with God. Yes, he set a time and place aside just so he could work on his relationship with God. So there's a room filled of stuff that you have at your house. You say, I don't really have a place to go and be with God, just me and Him. Clear it out. Make it a priority. How much of a priority did Daniel make it? If we want to set a standard, my opinion is we should at least have one time a day where it's just God and I. Not God and your wife or you and your wife. You, you, you need that time too. Not you and your best friend in the church, but just you and God. And Daniel did it three times a day. Daniel made it so much a priority that even after he found that the decree had been signed, it's the first thing he did. He kept on he risked his life just so he could pray. And so what we're talking about is living a life of worship. Not just participating in worship. Not just showing up to a place and worshiping. But when we leave and go out into the city, a life of worship. Una vida de Daniel chapter 6. Daniel capítulo 6. Oh well, no. Verse, one. verse 1. How do you say verse 1? Versículo 1. Versículo 1. Verse 1. <laughs> 1 through... Um, 1 through 5. Del 1 al 5. <risa> Pareció bien a Dios constituir sobre el reino 120 sátrapas. Dios, no Dios. 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 Pareció bien a Darío constituir sobre el reino 120 sátrapas que gobernasen en todo el reino. Y sobre ellos tres gobernadores, de los cuales Daniel era uno, y quienes estos sátrapas diesen cuenta para que el reino fuese perjudicado. Pero Daniel mismo era superior a estos sátrapas y gobernadores porque había en él un espíritu superior y el rey pensó en ponerlo sobre todo el reino entonces los gobernadores y sátrapas buscaban ocasión para acusar a Daniel y lo relacionado al reino mas no podían hallar ocasión alguna o falta porque él era fiel y ningún vicio ni falta fue hallado en él entonces dijeron aquellos hombres no hallaremos contra este Daniel ocasión alguna para acusarle si no la hallamos contra él en eh, contra él en relación con la ley de su Dios. Can that verse, verse five, be said of you? Se puede decir de ti. That when people look at your life, it's it's hard for them to find fault. Maybe you go to work, cut corners. Daniel didn't do that. 
Daniel didn't try to save 10 minutes out of his day to cut a corner. He did the job the way it was supposed to be done. Could your employer say that of you? That they would be willing to trust you even with the whole business. That's the life we need to live. You read on. These people, they decided they, they were going to go to Darius. And they were going to try to trap Daniel. They achieved it too. Because they actually got Darius to sign a petition. A decree. That said if anyone for 30 days. Prays or makes supplication. To any other God. But Darius. He would be thrown into the lions then. When Daniel was making his supplication to God, what was he risking? And where did they know to find him? How do you think they knew that? It was something he knew. It was common. It was his practice. Verse 10. Yes. and 11. 10 and 11. When Daniel supo que el edicto había sido firmado, entró en su casa y abiertas las ventanas de su cámara que daban hacia Jerusalén, se arrodillaba tres veces al día y oraba y daba gracias delante de su Dios como lo salía a hacer antes. Entonces se juntaron aquellos hombres y hallaron a Daniel orando so it says as he had been doing he made it a practice now I know we don't say we need to be in a certain posture so you don't you know you said you pray in the car right how many of you pray in the car or you know local you know transit the bus whatever how many of you are out and you pray that you're not on your knees okay that you're not on your knees in prayer okay now I would encourage you to not settle for that Some, sometimes I don't pray before a meal because I don't think I'm going to pray just because I think we should. Because that's been a practice of mine. Like God doesn't know I'm thank not thankful or thankful. God knows I am. I do pray before meals too. But I don't think it should just be something we do. Just because that's what we've done before. You're supposed to be paying attention to the road. Now, I know you can multitask. I can multitask, too. But you're supposed to be looking at the road. So your prayers to God might actually be a distraction. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But don't settle for that. Don't settle for prayers before your meals. Don't settle for prayers, rush prayers in the car on your way to work or on your way to school. Don't settle for that. It says Daniel went up into his upper room. It was not a common place. Not everyone went there. But for Daniel, it was a common place. He knew it well. And yes, he got down on his knees, the Bible tells us. You ever been in that position before? You're just on your knees, praying. It's just you and God. 
You're in that posture. You're in that place in your house. Yes, a place in your house that you've cleaned out. It's just you and God there. Yeah. And make it a practice. And then we look at Daniel and say, well, no, it makes sense now. No wonder they couldn't find anything wrong. I would say that that time with God will help you as you go out into the world and fight our enemy. Where did Daniel end up? Hmm? Oh, yeah, see? See? Where did he end up? This is the uh, free domain, free domain. I didn't rob. I don't, you, don't need to bring, you don't need to bring it up, but... <laughs> So we ended up in the lion's den. Well, there you go. We, I don't want to have that commitment with God. No way. Because this is where it's going to get me. And I don't want anything to do with lions. Yeah, he ended up. He didn't end up, but he got put into a lion's den. And it says, the angel of the Lord, what? Shut the mouths of the lions. I see. <laughs> Clean the air filter here. What's going on? They want to distract you. See? It's okay. So, there's another lion or there's someone else who prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. First uh, Peter 5 8 tells us that that is Satan looking to devour you. Devour simply means he doesn't want to leave anything left of you. Nothing. And Daniel said that there was an angel of the Lord who shut the mouths of the lions. And you think about that time, just you and God, in that place, on your knees, before you start your day. Or at the end of your day. Or in the middle of your day. And then you go out into the world where Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. God's going to shut his mouth. You have that time with him. You've, you've put on that armor. Right? You're ready. You ever left the house before and you haven't had that time? I mean, you really haven't had time to meditate on God's word. You haven't had that time in prayer to speak to God, just you and him. And then you walk right out the door and temptation is waiting for you. And Satan is roaring. And one of the very first times we interact with someone else, we aren't able to see the clear path of escape. It says God will provide a way of escape. With every temptation, a way of escape. But it begins with that time, that life of worship. Daniel's upper room, that was just a continuation of the life that he lived. It was a part of who he was. You say, well, 
There's no precedent in the New Covenant no hay en el Nuevo of being in a certain place, estar en lugar, certain posture, and I would say, yes, there is. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus doesn't say, if you pray, he says, when you pray. He says, go somewhere. Where does he say go? That, was Domingo talking about this earlier? Yeah, he read it earlier. Yeah. yeah. Where do you go? In a closet. You're in a room. Now, we spoke about allegory, and Jesus isn't speaking allegorically. He's speaking matter-of-factly. When you pray, when you pray, go into your inner room. Anybody have one? Your Heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you. Sometimes this gets overlooked, I think, in churches. I say, well, I pray every time I eat. I have an hour drive to work. I pray for an hour. Look, I get, I get distracted when I'm in that inner room. I do. Never mind in a car. Walking down the street. On the bus. Think about this. When you stand before God in judgment, who is it going to be? You and your wife and your family? Your husband and your family? Your best friend in church? It's going to be just you and God. Why not work in that relationship now? That's what it is. Some of us are pretty good at relationships. That's what we're doing. We're working on that relationship. During that time of just God and I. And I'm praying on my knees. Talking to God about my struggle. And I'm being honest. And then I dig into his word. And I'm not, I'm not just reading the word of God. I'm, I'm meditating on it. You ever had those times where you're just there? There's no sound. There's no nothing. It's just you and God's word. And your mind is open to his truth. And you're just chewing on it. That's what I'm talking about. You and God. Some, those are some of the best times you'll ever experience with your relationship with God. Do you have that time? Do you have that place? Don't settle for a fast food relationship. The drive through. Don't settle for that. You want a life of worship? You need to have that time. He wants that time with you. Daniel made it a priority to the point that his prayer life was going to cost him his life. That's how much of a priority it was for him. During that time, he was also confessing his sin. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 18. Daniel's praying to God. He's it says he's confessing his sin and the sins of the people. In verse 17, 18 and 19. No, 17 and 18, sorry. Ahora pues Dios nuestro, oye la oración de tu siervo y sus ruegos, y haz que tu rostro resplandezca sobre tu santuario asolado por amor del Señor. Inclina, oh Dios mío, tu oído, y oye, abre tus ojos, y mira nuestras desolaciones, y la ciudad sobre la cual es invocado tu nombre, porque no le vamos a Nuestra, nuestros regos ante ti confiados en nuestra justicia sino en tus muchas misericordias so what does he say in verse 18 as to why he's praying because he's so good 
so not anything I've done. It's, it's not on our merits, but your mercy. He recognized that relationship. He, re he recognized that. I don't pray because I, so I can go and tell Francisco, hey, I prayed seven times last week. Aren't you happy for me? <laughs> Or I'm a woman of prayer. And you walk around downtown Lawrence. I'm a woman of prayer. <laughs> Praying doesn't make you good. We say it again. Praying doesn't make you good. Daniel in prayer, if anything, recognized that he was not good. And here is a man who his enemies couldn't find anything wrong with him. And yet Daniel before God it's not because of anything I've done but because of your mercy God hear us. When's the last time you confessed your sin? When's the last time you talked with somebody about it? When's the last time you really come face to face with, you know what, this isn't right, and this is hindering, this is preventing me from having that life of worship? When's the last time? Is there anything to be thankful for in the church? See? 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 Let's just say that God decided that the only thing he was going to give to us was his son. No Bible. No Biblia. No spirit. No nothing. Just Jesus and his sacrifice. No intercession. No hearing our prayers. Would there still be something to be thankful for? How many times or how often do we forget? Do we forget how good God is? It tells us back in Daniel chapter 6 that when Daniel went before God in prayer in his upper room that he made supplication with thanksgiving. Where was Daniel? He was in exile. Yeah. Not a very thankful position. Where did he want to be? He wanted to be home. And yet it says he still thanked God. I forget a lot of things. If I don't put it on my calendar, on my phone, I will forget. I almost forgot that I had to come here. That would have been embarrassing. <laughs> Israel forgot a lot. You know, what were they in Egypt? Slaves. slaves. They had forgotten they were slaves, didn't they? Because they began to complain about the food they had. You ever complain about food? <laughs> Israel did too. Some of the basic things that God, Jesus preached about. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. He told the people listening and he tells us today. Seek first what? And his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you.
seeking his kingdom first and his righteousness and our basic needs will be met how many of you believe that today how many of you forgot that yesterday How many of you forgot that last Tuesday? Thankfulness helps us to remember that God hasn't just given us his son as if that were not enough but he has given us his word he has given us his spirit he has given us each other he's given us so many every spiritual blessing is ours And we can become so forgetful that we forget one of the basic characteristics of God. God is good. God is good. And so Daniel was expressing thankfulness, even in his situation, being in exile. Now, Darius did bless him, but God blessed him for his faithfulness to Daniel, for Daniel's faithfulness to him. He was put in the position of power. When you think about God's work, you think about what he's doing for you and what he's done for you. How thankful are you? Because that is worship. In the midst of your trial, and in the midst of your loss, I just lost my mother in December. It was hard because we didn't have the best relationship. She's 60 years old, young. So she died. I wasn't there with her when she died. Went to the hospital, saw her body, there she was. Still warm. Is God still with me? Can, can God relate to me? Does he understand? Yeah. Does Jesus understand? Is God still good? Yes. Jesus wept, didn't he? For someone that he'd lost. He can understand. If you've lost someone, you say, is God still good? Yes. And he understands how you feel. There's some people that come alongside and they try to be helpful, right? You're going through a hard time, you're sad, you've got a lot of things on your mind, and they come alongside and they say, I understand. But they don't really. They don't. God does. It says Jesus was tempted in everything, yet without sin. He's able to come to the uh, help to those who are in need. He understands your loss. He understands your trial. He understands your temptation. He understands you. So don't forget. God is good. Be thankful. So we enter Daniel's upper room. We find prayer. We find confession. We find thankfulness. 
We're going to take a look at uh, David in Psalm 119. And David understood something. Think about a life of worship. It includes, a life of worship includes prayer. It includes meditation. It includes worship as far as singing and song. It includes Bible study. It includes other things as well. But when you think about the Word of God, what is it? How does the Bible describe itself? God, please. How much um, time would you say you spend in front of a mirror? <laughs> Sisters, how much time do you spend in front of a mirror? Some of you guys, and Lois asked her this last time, she was like, None. No, we're, we're confessing now. <laughs> but the Bible is described as a mirror. And what's it reflecting? Who I am. And so if the Bible is showing me who I am, and who's the one who's created us anyway? So who knows us more than anybody else? And if he is the author of the Bible, which is described as a mirror, where else can I go to find a better source to find out who I am? And so we stand in front of the mirror. Every time we open it, right? Then we study. I see me. I see myself. How God sees me. The mirror. And so when we have that time, when we make that time, we look in the mirror. We don't forget who we are. We don't deceive ourselves. We look at the mirror. You look at your mirror at your house. Right? You see you got something on your face. You say, oh, I'll get it later. Then you walk away. And you forget that it was there. Right? And any good friend would do what? You got something on your face. But I got bad friends. And so they let me walk around all day at work. And I got something on my face. Go back home, look in the mirror. Oh! But when we look at the Word of God, we can't do that. When it's telling us we got something on our face, and then we walk away and forget we've deceived ourselves. But David, David in Psalm 119, David understood something. One through sixteen. One nineteen. Salmo ciento diecinueve. Del uno al dieciséis. Um, hold on. Fifteen and sixteen. Just fifteen and sixteen. Quince y dieciséis. Salmo ciento diecinueve. Quince y dieciséis. En tus mandamientos meditaré. Consideraré tus caminos, me regocijaré en tus estatutos, no me olvidaré de tus palabras. What did David understand? What did he understand about the Word of God? Entendía de la palabra de Dios. 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 Ent
Why? Why did he think? Why did he do that? What did he know about the Word of God? Oh, okay. What? Salvation. Okay, there was salvation in them. Okay, eternal life. But think about it for a minute. David, the adulterer. David, the murderer. How did he commit those things? Was he following God's word? So he was doing his own thing. And so when he got to a point in his life, he's writing this psalm, and he says, I want to meditate on it. Why? Because if I do it on my own, I'm done. I'm a murderer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a cheater. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. If I do it on my own, I'm lost. And so when we look at the Word of God, brothers and sisters, it's not just a book with words on it, or words in it. It's God's Word speaking to us, showing us who we are, and then telling us how we can change. David understood that. He recognized who he was compared to what God had told him. And he said, I've been wrong all this time. God, I need your word. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young woman keep her way pure, but by keeping it according to your own ways? Keeping it according to your word. David understood that. And so when we have that time, brothers and sisters, when we're in that inner room and we're digging into God's word, let's approach it like that. Let's approach it like our life depended on that time. Because guess what? It does. Matthew 4.4, 4, and we'll close. Matthew 4.4, 4, and then we're done. Mateo 4.4 4. Él respondió y dijo, Escrito está, No solo del pan vivirá el hombre, what did Jesus mean? Man shall not live, Matthew 4 4. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What does he mean? Now, Jesus had been driven into the wilderness. Now, it's kind of ironic because just before this, God had said at his baptism, what? In whom I am well pleased. Now, go be tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And so as 40 days and nights have passed, he's hungry. Go figure. And Satan comes and tempts him. See, the roaring lion. It says, turn these stones. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. What a temptation. What a temptation. Don't, don't think of that lightly. That's huge. There's a lot going on right now. 
40 days and 40 nights, you're hungry. I'm beyond hungry. I've got, I've got food in my belly sometimes. And you know what I'll tell my wife? I'm starving. <laughs> no, you're not. No. Jesus didn't have any food anywhere. And he could turn stones into bread. And he says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How much do you depend on the Word of God? Is it just a book to bring out in emergencies? Or is your life dependent upon what He says? Make that time. You may not agree, but clear out that room. Have that place. Yes, that place in your house. Yes. Where you can go, just you and God. And have that life of worship. God bless you guys. We're